the grace of Christ be with you all. Welcome to worship on this first Sunday after Easter. My name is Shane Whalen, and I'm the pastor of student families here at Rivermont Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And this morning I will be serving in this worship service with our senior pastor, Dr. David Weber, and our pastor of relational discipleship, Mike Palumbo. We are grateful for the music of Peggy Betcher, who will be playing the organ. Heidi Terry and Amy Hall will be leading us in song. As we seek to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we encourage you to take advantage of ongoing discipleship opportunities throughout the week using Zoom. On Sunday mornings, there are Sunday school classes that meet at 9 a.m. and sermon discussion takes place at 11 a.m. There are Zoom Bible studies that take place throughout the week as well. The men meet Tuesday mornings at 6.30 a.m. and the women meet on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. All of this information can be found on our website under the Connect Zoom Discipleship tab. Also, we encourage you to continue to watch our daily pastor devotions that are online as well. As we prepare to worship the Lord, please join me in prayer. O oh, Father of grace and mercy, what a blessing and privilege it is to worship you. Lord, we ask now that we would worship you in spirit and truth. O oh, Spirit, come. And Lord, we ask that you would receive all glory, honor, and praise Do your name. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. At this time, please stand for the call to worship from Psalm 3. O Lord, you are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Now let us sing our hymn of praise from all that dwell below the skies. Please join me in the prayer of adoration and confession. Heavenly Father, you have searched us and understood. You know when we stand up or sit down. You understand our thoughts from afar. Nothing of ours is hidden from you. But who has known your mind? Transform our hearts. Renew our thoughts. For we confess they have become too conformed to the pattern of this world 
And as the natural mind cannot understand spiritual things, our worldliness has blinded us from understanding you. Yet you have shown us grace, so we give you thanks, for you have given us the mind of Christ. You have indwelt us with your spirit, that we may know the things which come not from human wisdom, but which are taught by you alone. Through the knowledge of your Son, you have given us the ability to understand spiritual things. By knowing him, we have everything pertaining to life and godliness. Father, teach us that we may know and approve of your will. Change us that we may desire that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Amen. In 1 John 1, 9, we are told that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the gospel. We are forgiven because of the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are able to stand before the throne of God because of what Christ has done for us. Let us sing his praise. be seated. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our online worship service this Sunday as we continue our study of the Psalms with the study of Psalm 3. I would invite you and your homes to open up your Bibles to Psalm 3 as we begin this morning's sermon. As you turn there, you will see that the psalm begins with a heading that identifies the historical situation that gave rise to Psalm 3's writing. The heading says this, A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. Now, in 2 Samuel chapters 13 through 19, we have the history of Absalom and his rebellion against his father, David. And I would encourage you to go back and read chapters 13 through 19 of 2 Samuel at your home later. But a quick overview right now. Absalom was the type of man that had everything going for him. He was handsome. The Bible says that he had long, thick, beautiful, flowing hair. He had a winning personality and he was the son of the king. And yet, despite all of his positive attributes, he was also vengeful. His story begins with his desire to revenge a wrong done to his sister, Tamar. 
And Absalom felt that because his sister had been violated by their half-brother Amnon, that he needed to seek revenge and right the wrong against her. The Bible tells us that he waited two full years scheming to make this wrong right. But when the time came, Absalom struck against his brother Amnon and had him murdered. Then he fled from Jerusalem. Now, after three years of self-imposed exile, King David called his son, invites his son to come back to Jerusalem, to be back with the family, and yet to be under house arrest. As you could imagine, Absalom chafes under this punishment, and he begins to plot against his father. He uses his winning personality to turn key individuals against David because he wants revenge against his father for punishing him for enacting vengeance against his brother. Again, when the time is right, he begins a rebellion, steals the throne, declares himself king of Israel, and David and those faithful to him must flee from Jerusalem to safety at this unforeseen turn of events. David has been truly humbled. He's running from his own son. He has lost his kingdom. And to add insult to injury, as he is fleeing from Jerusalem, the word of God tells us that a man came out to taunt him. In 2 Samuel 16, we read that a man stood atop a hillside and threw dirt and rocks at King David and cursed him, saying, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned, and the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. This is the situation that Psalm 3 is addressing. David is down. David is defeated. He's on the run for his life. And the people that are against him are his very own family. And as he is on the run, people are rubbing salt in the wounds. The knife that has been thrust into his back is being twisted. See, David, you deserve this. This is your fault. And so we read in verses 1 and 2 of our psalm, O Lord, How many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. This is the provocation that Psalm 3 was written to address. How do you trust in the salvation of the Lord when everything and everyone is telling you that there is no salvation for you? How can you rest in the Lord when you are on the run from the world? Many of you might be asking that question even now. There are so many difficulties in life, so many forces opposing your well-being, that it is tempting to listen to the voice that says there is no salvation for you in God. For if there were, this wouldn't be happening to you. Of course, all of us at this time are dealing with the stress of the COVID-19 pandemic. The health concerns, the economic, the educational and relational stress that it is bringing. And yet, life's regular problems and stresses are not on lockdown. There are still tornadoes that are ripping across the country. People are still being diagnosed and treated for cancer. Cars are still breaking down. Basements are still getting flooded. Marriages are strained. Children are bored and restless. And for some unknown reason, toilet paper has disappeared from all of the grocery stores in the country. There have been times over the past several weeks in which I know that you have felt like the boy plugging the proverbial dam with his fingers, stretched out hoping that no other leak forms because you're running out of digits to keep this thing together. And so, when all that is going on in the world is telling you that there is no help, 
that there is no salvation, how do you find rest in the Lord? What we'll see in our psalm for this morning is that every Christian can rest in the Lord's salvation even when we're on the run from the world because Christ is our shield, Christ is our sustainer, and Christ is our avenger. So hear now the word of the Lord, Psalm 3. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how many are my foes! Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you now in this moment. We approach your scriptures with reverence and gratitude that you have preserved for us your life-giving revelation. Be present with us through your Holy Spirit and lift high the cross so that Christ's amazing love might be proclaimed in the preaching of your inspired and inerrant word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Claustrophobic is the word that I would use to describe the tone of verse 1. There it says, O Lord, how many are my foes, many are rising against me. One commentator says of this verse, one can almost sense the panic as the psalmist turning this way and that, seeking a way out, sees only the multitude of enemies pressing ever closer, about to overwhelm. Perhaps the image is of being tightly bound and unable to escape, something like what the victim of a boa constrictor experiences as the relentless coils draw ever tighter, cutting off escape and crushing life. You see, David is surrounded by his enemies. Their pursuit is hot. They come ever closer with each moment. They press in upon him, cutting off all hope of escape. And then we read in verse 3 of our text, But you, O Lord, You are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Yes, the enemy has surrounded David. Yet even more importantly than that, for all those who trust in the Lord, you are surrounded by him as a shield. He stands between you and your enemy, for he is a shield about you on every side. What David means by calling the Lord his shields is explained first by the word, my glory. In the book of Numbers, there were various rebellions against the leadership of Moses. And each time these rebellions came about, the Lord sent forth his glory cloud to defend Moses. We read in number 16, for example, about the rebellion of Korah. Then Korah assembled all the congregation against them, that's against Moses and Aaron, at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. 
You see, the glory of the Lord was a manifestation of his power and his holiness that was there to be a shield about Moses and Aaron to show that he had anointed them to leadership. And David is saying that as his shield, the Lord will manifest his power and might on behalf of him to defend him as the king against this rebellion. Hebrews 1, thir, uh, 1, 1.3 tells us that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. And we understand, as those who trust in Jesus Christ, as our enemies are coming against us, that Jesus Christ in his incarnation, his life, death, and resurrection, is a manifestation of the power of God on our behalf to shield us from our enemies. The Lord is our glory. Second, he says that as his shield, the Lord is the lifter of his head. Now, the expression to lift your head is a sign of dignity and of honor. And yet, if you lift your own head, if you are the lifter of your own head, it is a sign of arrogance and pride. Absalom had lifted his own head against his father by stealing the throne. In contrast, David says that the Lord is the lifter of his head. It is a sign that it is God who confers honor on David. As his son takes his throne, as bypassers are throwing dirt and insults upon him, he trusts that his honor and his dignity will not be defended by his own words or his own actions, but rather that the Lord is the one who gives him honor and dignity in the midst of his hardship. And third, as a shield, the Lord answers David's prayers. As David is on the run, he calls out to the Lord. The imagery is interesting here. If you think of the geography, he is running away from the city of Jerusalem. And he has made an intentional decision, if you read through 2 Samuel narrative, to leave the Ark of the Covenant, the symbolic presence of God's throne in Jerusalem. By all accounts, geographically, the Lord is becoming more and more distant from David. And yet, as we read, the image implies that while he is running away from Jerusalem, he is calling out towards this holy hill. Even as he is getting farther and farther away from the holy hill of Zion, by prayer he is getting closer and closer to the Lord. For even when we feel the most distant from the Lord because of great hardship or distress in our lives, God's word is telling us that we can always call out to him in prayer and know that he will hear our prayers. This is how you rest in the Lord while on the run from the world. You trust him as your shield. You trust the manifestation of his power in the Lord Jesus Christ to protect you. You trust his kindness to restore to you honor and dignity. And you trust his presence to abide with you even when you feel like you are more and more distant from him because of your hardship. For as your shield, he will hear you and he will answer your cries for help. Insomnia is a common response to stress in our lives. Doctors and scientists who study sleep and stress refer to the mental state of stress as causing hyperarousal, in which the brain and body operate as if it is on alert. And when you come to bedtime, you can't tell your mind that this threat has passed. If you have ever experienced insomnia, you know that it is a vicious cycle. You're stressed out, and so you can't sleep. But as the night wears on, you get more and more stressed because you know how tired you're going to be tomorrow. But then you think, well, I'm going to be so tired by being up all night that tomorrow night I will be so exhausted I'll go to sleep. 
But then you begin to worry, what if I can't go to sleep? And then you get to the second night and you're all keyed up because you want to be relaxed so that you can go to sleep. And the cycle goes on and on and on as stress puts you on alert and you cannot rest. As you can imagine, it would be rather difficult to sleep while on the run for your life. David is being pursued. If Absalom's forces catch up to him, he is done for. He is away from his home. His life is being threatened. Not the best conditions for a good night's rest. Nevertheless, we read in verses 5 and 6 these words. I lay down and slept. I awoke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. No Ambien, no z no melatonin, not even a nice hot cup of chamomile tea to put him to bed. As David is on the run from Absalom, he is able to lay down and sleep. He is able to find rest even when all of his world has been thrown into turmoil. How? How can he rest while he is on the run? Because he knows that it is the Lord who sustains him. While his troubles and enemies multiply around him, he realizes that endless worry will not make his problems go away. It is only the Lord who can sustain him. What has kept you awake lately? What enemy are you fearing today? What foe is stealing your peace in your sleep? Is it health concerns? Are you fearful of losing your job? Are you struggling with your relationships? Are you up at night trying to predict an unpredictable future? You will not be able to find rest on the run if you are not willing to trust the Lord to sustain you and to turn from your own power. It reminds me of the time a great storm arose on the Sea of Galilee. The disciples of Jesus begin to flip out with fear that they are going to be capsized in their boat and that they will die. Yet in the very midst of the storm, we read that Jesus was asleep. Can you imagine? He was asleep as the boat was taking on water. He was asleep as the waves were thrusting the boat down and up along the shore or along the waves. And so the disciples wake him up and say, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. How can you find rest in the midst of the storm? How can you find sleep while overwhelmed with the stress of this world? You trust in the grace and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ as your sustainer, that by his grace you will wake tomorrow to a new day, that by his grace there will be peace in the midst of the storm because the one who commands the wind and the waves is with you in the boat. Even as the Lord promises his people in Isaiah 43, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. For worry and anxiety will never sustain you. It will not provide for you in this time of need. But the Lord promises to sustain and save his people to give them rest. Even as Psalm 127 says, It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. You can rest in the midst of the storm of life because the Lord Jesus promises to be the one who sustains you.
Now, if you combine a personality that is narcissistic with anger, the result is vengeance. I am sure that all of us have had moments when we fantasize about revenge that we are going to get on someone who has wronged us to repay tit for tat every hurt that has been incurred. For me, when I'm sitting at a stoplight and I see somebody throw a cigarette butt out of their car window, there's part of me that wants to get out of my car, pick it up, and throw it back in the car at them just to get revenge against those who would want to use our roads as their own personal ashtray. But I know that there are other more personal times when you want revenge. Maybe a girlfriend or a boyfriend leaves you and makes, and makes you let, feel hurt, and you imagine that you're going to trash them on Facebook so everyone knows how horrible a person that they are. Or when somebody hurts someone you love, like a child, you want them to feel that same pain that you feel. So in your mind, you plan out your revenge of how you're going to get back at them. Revenge is based upon a feeling of injustice. You feel that it is your right to enact justice against those who have wronged you or someone you love. Yet vengeance never leads to justice, but only to more injustice. Take Absalom, for instance. He wanted a wrong done to his sister made right. And in all truth, this is a natural and a healthy desire to want to see justice established but he pursued justice through his own power, and he did not trust the Lord. And what did it lead to? He murdered his brother. He betrayed his father. He threw the nation of Israel into a civil war, and we read that to establish his own power and authority, that he took ten of his father's concubines, set up a tent on the roof of the palace, and he raped them one by one. His vengeance done, enacted because his own sister had been violated, now has turned into a tenfold wrong against others. Vengeance brought about on our own behalf, with our own power only, will lead to more injustice in this world. It will never lead to rest, but only more pain. Therefore, if you would rest in the midst of a world of injustice, you must let go of your pride and anger and trust that it is the Lord who will avenge the wrongs that have been done to you and those whom you love. Look at verses 7 and 8. There we read, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. How do you give up vengeance? How do you turn the other cheek? You turn the other cheek because you know that it is the Lord's prerogative to strike the enemies on the cheek. Wrong must be punished. Justice is dear to the heart of the Lord. Yet if you would see true justice enacted, we must not give in to hateful vengeance, but we must trust the Lord to be the avenger of wrongs. For the word of God tells us, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Justice and salvation can be a nasty bit of business. For how many Egyptian firstborns died that Israel might be free? And sometimes we have a hard time when we read in the Psalms verses like verse 7 that call out for and even take joy and comfort in the Lord destroying our enemies. However, when you are on the run because of pain and hardship, 
When you or a loved one has been greatly hurt or violated, there is comfort in trusting that the Lord will make right all wrong suffered, that the Lord will act to see justice brought about in every single situation. If David is going to be restored to the throne, if Absalom's rebellion is going to put, be put down, then there is going to have to be some smashed teeth in the process. But there is a huge difference between David's prayer and Absalom's actions. For David trusted the Lord to avenge and protect him and to restore to him what was rightfully his, while Absalom sought to avenge himself. One is rooted in unforgiveness and pride and anger, and the other is rooted in trust and humility and ultimately love for our enemies, that we would not bring the hand of vengeance against them, but we would entrust them to the Lord that he might do what is right. And if you would rest in the Lord, you must give up your vengeance. You must give up your plotting and your scheming for recompense and trust that the Lord will avenge all wrong. How could David get a good night's rest even while he was on the run from Absalom? That's what we are asking this morning. How can we trust the Lord to shield us, to sustain us, and to avenge us? As we trace the history of Absalom's rebellion, we see the Lord's hand of providence moving to frustrate the plans of Absalom and to reestablish David upon the throne. In the battle that eventually comes between those who support David and those who support Absalom, we read that David commanded that his own son be spared in the battle. He does not want his son Absalom killed. Yet as David's mighty men begin to win the battle, Absalom, riding through the woods on the back of a donkey, gets his beautiful, long, thick hair caught in the branches of a tree. We're told that the donkey then walks out from under him, and he is left hanging there in this tree. When he's discovered dangling, David's men disregard the command not to kill Absalom. And they thrust him through with spears. They surround him and they beat him and they throw him into a pit and they cover him with stones. The path of vengeance and pride lead not to justice, but to injustice and death. For Absalom, as the son of David, would have been king of Israel, but his pride led him to a shameful end, hanged upon a tree, a spear thrust into his side, dead and buried. This is ultimately how we rest in the Lord in the midst of our hardship. We trust that he will save those who trust in him, and he will bring vengeance against those who turn from him. And, know, and we know this because of the cross of Jesus Christ. For Jesus, as the son of David, like Absalom, was hanged upon a tree like Absalom, thrust through with a spear like Absalom, and buried like Absalom. And yet he underwent this punishment not for his own rebellion and sin, but because of our rebellion and vengeance and sin. For we, like Absalom, have sought out the path of vengeance, and we deserve the end that he met. By our sin, we have earned the grave. And the Lord Jesus Christ came as the avenger of sin to see justice enacted and to see sin punished. Yet by his grace, the punishment that was due us fell upon him so that all who put their trust in him can find rest from the pain of this world and relief from the guilt of sin. For by his blood our sins have been atoned for. Our warfare has ended, and we who were once at war with God have been made sons by faith. How can you rest on the run 
How can you lay down and sleep when there is so much stress in this world? How can you forgive and let go of wrongs when you have been so deeply wounded? You must trust that Christ is your shield. You must trust that Christ is your sustainer. And you must trust that Christ is your avenger. For through offering himself upon the cross, he has poured out his blood for all who would trust in him and who would ultimately find their rest not in themselves, but in his work alone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you now. Lord, and we confess that so often we cannot rest. We are filled with stress and worry because we are trying to figure out how we will shield ourselves. We figure out how, we're trying to figure out how we will sustain ourselves. And we are trying to figure out how we will avenge ourselves against the wrong done to us. Lord, in this time, we offer to you all of our brokenness, all of our hurt, all of our fear, all of our anxiety, all of our sin, for we trust that in Christ we will be protected, we will be sustained, and that justice will ultimately be done. We pray this through Christ's holy name, for his honor and glory. Amen. If you would, at this time, stand as we come to unite our hearts and voices together in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. So I ask you now, Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I pray for us in a pastoral prayer, I want to share a few ways that you can connect with us in prayer in this time. For corporate prayer, we want to encourage you to join us at our 4 p.m. Zoom prayer meeting. Uh, you can access this meeting on our featured event on our website. Simply click that featured event and click the Zoom link. For this prayer time, we pray the sermon text through the Acts acrostic, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. So please join us today at 4 p.m. And then also for personal prayer, we've developed a resource called Morning to Evening Prayer. You can find more about this resource in our pastor's devotion. This is a rhythm for morning prayer, midday prayer, and evening prayer. You can also email me, mike at rivermont.org, and I'll be happy to send one to you. And if you have any prayer requests at all, please do send us those prayer requests at rivermont.org backslash prayer, and we'll be delighted to pray for you throughout the week. Let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Gracious God of rest and salvation, we listen to your still voice calling us home. 
Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We are restless in our running, tired in our striving, and impatient in our constant pressure in this time. Help us to return our soul to your rest and realize all the ways you have dealt with us in your goodness. When we are afraid, help us to put our trust in you. As we continue in various trials in this season, help us to keep seeking things that are above, where Christ is resurrected at the right hand of God. Help us to set our minds on things above and not on sinful things below on earth. We pray especially for those that are facing particular challenges in this time, whether physical, emotional, social, or spiritual. Hear us in the silence of our own hearts as we bring to you specific people who need your healing help. We pray specifically for Marty Hallgren, for Ryan Webb, for Greg Alte, and others that suffer with cancer. Please eradicate the cancer from their body and help them endure through treatments. We pray for Kay Alby, Sophia Boyers, and Paul Kouris, that you would restore their bodies as they recuperate. We pray for Pres Terrell and others that you would restore health to them in their sickness. We pray for all of us that you would help us to persevere in hope as we wait for our final resurrection. We trust that you will resurrect our broken bodies and restore our broken relationships. We pray for local, national, and global leaders, for President Trump and his advisors, for the House and the Senate, for the judicial branch. We also pray for Governor Ralph Northam, for our local city council, Mayor Trinae Tweedy, Centra Health, and medical workers. Please help them to lead with your wisdom, to love with your compassion, and to communicate respectfully and truthfully. Continue to guide doctors and healthcare workers as they seek to provide the best information regarding this virus. Help us citizens to respectfully submit to the guidance of our president and health workers. And we pray, O oh God, that you would put an end to the coronavirus, that we would know your peace and your healing power. We pray for ongoing protection and preservation of medical workers and essential workers who still work in public. Place a hedge of your protection over them and shield them from this virus. Help them to labor out of love as they serve many in our cities. Knowing that salvation belongs to the Lord, we pray for your mission in the world. Bless us that we may be a blessing to the nations. Grant us boldness to share the gospel in the midst of much conflict. Help us to serve our family and neighbors with the love of Christ. And we pray that you would grant all of our missionaries wisdom and grace to minister to the nations in this time of social distancing. As many missionaries are sheltering in place, make your face shine on them that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. We entrust all these prayers to you, God the Father, through the risen King Jesus, and pray your kingdom prayer you taught us to pray, saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Out of gratefulness to God for his many blessings to us, let us now be a blessing to others and give to him our, his tithes and our offerings for his glory. There are three ways to give in this time of social distancing. One way is to give by text, by simply texting 434-595-3833 and follow the prompts. You can also give online at rivermont.org give. Or you can give by mail by sending a check out to Rivermont EPC and send your check to 2424 Rivermont Avenue, Lynchburg, Virginia, 24503. Well, at this time, let us consider the beauty of Jesus our Savior in the offertory anthem as we hear a song, Jesus is all the world to me.
Please stand as we sing God's praise in the doxology. Let us now unite our voices as we say together this offertory prayer. Almighty and gracious Father, we give you thanks and praise for all your goodness to us and over all creation. But above all, we give thanks for the gift of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, in whom alone we have life and peace and everlasting joy. Trusting in him, our Savior, we offer our hearts to you, eagerly and entirely, with joy and gratitude. And we pray that you will bless and multiply these tokens of our lives and use them for the sake of your kingdom throughout the earth. For the glory of your name, amen. Please stand wherever you are as we sing our hymn of response, Be Thou My Vision. Oh, 
children of God, as you seek to find your rest in the Lord, to rest in him as your shield, as your sustainer, as your avenger, hear now the Lord's blessing over you. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Amen. Amen.